In the following lecture, Professor Lawrence Anthony, Professor of Corpus Linguistics, Educational Technology, and Applied Linguistics at Waseda University in Japan, discusses recent changes in corpus linguistics research. He explains how these changes have led to new opportunities for corpus research. He then talks about desktop and web-based corpus tools that can assist corpus linguists in their research. At the end of the lecture, he explains how newcomers to corpus linguistics can best learn to use these tools and apply them in interesting corpus linguistics studies. I am going to be talking about new directions in corpus design and corpus tools development. I'm not saying that all these developments are good. In fact, I'm going to actually say some of these are not so great. Uh, I'm not promoting these as the way forward. Rather, I'm just pointing out these are the directions that we seem to be heading, and it raises some interesting questions about where we position ourselves as researchers and teachers uh, in this changing world. Okay, I do also appreciate that we have a very mixed audience today. I think some people here are, uh, probably know more about corpus linguistics than even I do. Uh, some people may have never even heard of the word corpus linguistics. So I'm going to try and take it kind of slowly and then go through defining what corpus linguistics is, introducing some of the tools, and then hopefully at the end do some things that people haven't seen before. Um, that might be, I hope, interesting for everybody. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, recent changes in corpus linguistics in general and talk about what corpus linguistics has become, the, the three main parts of corpus linguistics, the data, the tools, and the applications of the tools. And then for everybody here, I would like you to consider three different routes to uh, language research, perhaps using corpora. And then Maybe the main part of the talk is perhaps uh, introducing some practical tools for corpus linguistics research that you can all use immediately, like today. They're all online, they're all free, and you can just go today and start using them in your own work. Now, I'm going to be giving a case study of uh, an example of using these tools, but it is just a case study. I hope you can look at the case study and then see where you could perhaps use the same tools or similar tools in different work. So see that as a, an example of the things that are possible with corpus tools and data, but don't just think that's all you can do. Okay, and then I want to finish by, this will be a brief discussion on uh, learning and applying corpus tools and methods in this area. So where, where should you go from now? After listening to this talk, what's the next step if you're interested in pursuing this area? Okay, so I'm going to start uh, looking, at, looking at recent changes in corpus linguistics, but just to make sure everybody's on the same page, I want to start with a definition of what corpus linguistics is. Okay, so corpus linguistics, according to Biber, Conrad, and Reppen, three very well-known scholars in the field who wrote a great book about corpus linguistics, say it is an empirical, which means an experimental approach to language research, an analysis of actual patterns of use in target texts. And the word actual is important here. It means like real. It's not some theoretical idea. It's actually happening in the real world. It uses a corpus of natural texts as a basis for the analysis. And you see here this natural, again, is kind of hinting at this realness. It's really the real text. Okay? And the corpus just means a language database in some sense. And the corpus traditionally was a representative sample of target language stored as an electronic call, uh, database, and the plural's corpora. And then it relies on computer software to do the analysis, because traditionally the, so the database is quite big. There's a lot of words in that database, so we need some software to analyze that. And um, the results are generated using these automatic methods, but also interactive techniques. So we do searching in the database or the corpus, but then we look at the results and have to interpret them in some way. So it's not just giving us the answers. We have to use our brains at l a little, at least, <laughs> to do that. So it, did, it does depend on quantitative uh, techniques, so counting, counting word frequencies and so on. But it also requires qualitative analytical techniques. So again, you need to think about what you're seeing. There is a danger that people see corpus linguistics as this kind of just data, numbers, ranking frequencies, and that's it. It's not, and we have a little bit more to that, okay? So 
You can see here an empirical approach using corpora with software and doing quantitative and qualitative methods. Okay, so I want to now look at uh, how things are changing in the field of corpus linguistics, how that impacts us as researchers and teachers. So I'm going to focus first on data itself. Now, traditionally, in the 1960s, the data store, the corpus, was quite small. Well, it, well one million words it may sound big, but in the 1960s, it was big. A million words of languages seemed to be quite a lot. But as we go through, in the 1980s, 18 million words for another Cobill corpus for the dictionary, the Cobill Dictionary. 1990s, the British National Corpus was 100 million words. And then we have the Bank of English at Birmingham at 650 million. Uh, standard dictionaries now use these massive corpora, uh, like billion words, and Google's trillion word corpus for their analyses. So you can see that the corpora are getting massively, massive, really. And we can plot this, and that's Brown, and that's Oxford. You can see a very different size of corpus, which means the analysis is going to be different too, and so on. I'll come to that in a moment. What we also see, though, is a move from principled corpora, where you would know exactly what was in the corpus, because you were building it really by hand almost in some way. Every file you knew. But as it gets bigger, we know less and less about what's actually in it. It becomes more opportunistic. So Brown, back in the 1960s, that was very well constructed, very carefully constructed. And um, B and C in the 1990s, again, 100 million words, but still carefully crafted. As we start getting bigger and bigger, we start actually just kind of scraping the web for all kinds of related files, but not really knowing so much about what's in those files. Okay. Maybe more noisy, and maybe not so clear who wrote them, and so on. And then we finally get to Google, and they're trillion words, and they're just collecting the web in some sense. So it becomes more opportunistic, which is kind of not a great direction for a researcher if they want to know what's in that data source. But we still get good results in some cases. OK, so that's one big trend. And it's actually continuing to the point now, I would say right now, where a corpus is no longer this representative sample of a target real data. It's just a, a large collection of written or spoken text that is used for research. It's kind of dumb. But that's where we're coming, I think. People don't see corporate to be nicely constructed. It's just data. It's just data. <laughs> okay, language data is where we are now. Okay, and that's one big change. So if you hear the word corpus now, don't think of something carefully constructed. It may not be. Just data. Okay, so another change is this, what I just mentioned about plain text to tag data and getting more complicated annotation we started out in the 1960s with something like that, an ID and some text. But people wanted to do an interesting analysis of that, so they started doing pause tagging, part of speech tagging. And it makes it more complicated to analyze, but you can do more interesting searches. And we kept going. And then when BNC was created, they used XML to like add tag, uh, headers and information about who was speaking to who, and when, and where, and the size, and so on. And just a this year, in another month, the spoken BNC 2014 will be released. Very new corpus, super modern. And if you look at the header again, we have the same idea of lots of annotation in the data. So we know the year, the period, the speakers, the speaker's home, the relationship of people who are speaking in the data set. Who's speaking to who, and what is their relation, and what is the activity? Partners have a chat about jet lag, and, and so on. So it gives you lots of information, but then, of course, it leads to more problems with tools and how we would analyze that. OK, so let's go to tools. So what's happening with tools? Back in the 1960s, that was the tool that people used, a very simple tool. Very big, but simple. Okay? In the 1960s, these computers could not do very much at all. Okay? So I would call these simple first. And um, Tony McHenry and Andrew Hardy, in their book of corpus linguistics, calls this first generation tools. Big mainframe servers doing very simple jobs, counting words and so on. 
in the eight, 70s, 80s, we had the second generation of tools like Micro Concord, the first kind of PC-based simple corpus tool. In the 1990s, 2000s, we get tools like Wordsmith Tools and uh, Anconc, okay, if you know these, okay. They're more general. They, they work with different systems. They have lots of functionality. And then we get to the fourth generation where we're kind of back on a server in a mainframe system, and we have these web-based systems now where, again, we don't have the data locally. We go online and we access this data. We've got, that's uh, COCA, if you know that, Corpus of Contemporary American English. This is Sketch Engine, a big framework for all kinds of online data analysis. We've got uh, Lancaster University's uh, CQP web. And we actually get an explosion of different web interfaces to different corpora that are online. For copyright reasons, for speed reasons, for complexity reasons. As the, comp as the data becomes more annotated and carefully constructed, it's not easy to use a general tool to analyze it. So people have to build special tools to analyze it in a particular way. So we have all these tools being developed. So that's the direction we're going. As I say, it's not all positive in some way. Let's go one step further. Okay, if we have very complicated data and we want to analyze it and we don't have somebody to program our interface, what do we do? Well, people are now moving to programming languages. You have to program. It's kind of going back to the 60s in some way. You have to get out your code and code it yourselves. Can you, do you want to do that? This is at one definite direction. And um, Stefan Greaves, who's a strong proponent of R, came last year to, to the university and gave a workshop on how to do, use R to do analysis. And that's a definitely a direction we're going. Okay. So what about applications then? That's also kind of interesting. So traditionally, uh, corpus linguistics work with looking at language for language purposes in some sense, building dictionaries, making language learning materials, and so on. And, th and it was very successful at doing that. It's kind of broadened its scope now. The data's bigger, it has more annotation, we know more about who's speaking. So we're kind of moving to this area of corpora in discourse analysis. This is, again, corpus approaches to discourse, investigating adolescent health communication, and so on and so on. There's many other books that would illustrate this shift from language to language in society, I would say. More of this broader perspective. And a couple of good examples of this are the CAS Center in Lancaster University, Corpus Approaches to Social Science. If you look at their website, and they, they list some of the projects of now and of the past, and we have healthcare, urban violence in Brazil, climate change, online misogyny, distressed communities, religion, corporate communication. It's kind of broad. It's not really like how do we teach language to students now. It's more of this social idea. And at Birmingham University, who I'm a graduate from there, again, they have a very big corporate center. And if you look at what they're doing, they're looking at Dickens' work in literature studies. Uh, again, children's literature here, dialectology, looking at how language emerges in culture, in society, and how does it spread across countries, in, and so on. All kinds of, and of course, things like pattern grammar and language in specialized disciplines. So they're not losing the original point, but they're expanding their scope. Okay, so mm, I've got some examples now. So when you want to look at language just for language purposes, we can just use our simple table or keyword in context display, and we can see the word, and we can see the words around it, and we can understand how it's used, where it's used, and so on. Okay, and we can do frequency charts and see the most frequent word and so on. And that was the traditional approach, and it's very successful, and people still do it today. But if you're wanting to start looking at how language evolves or how it shifts or, how it, and, and, or, or who's saying it or who's using it, these visualizations are not enough. And we, have, we start getting these complicated visualizations, complicated statistical measures of frequency, not just a, a single value, but a dispersion. And we have like plotting where people say things in location, not just frequency. Because we're going beyond just language, we might want to like 
do a visual picture of language and kind of use it for advertising, for promoting and things like that. So we have word clouds, and then we have these beautiful network graphs that show uh, nodes could be people or text and how they're linked to other people or texts. So you can start seeing connections between text and purpose and so on. Okay, so we've kind of get quite far with this. So where are we going? So I feel that corpus linguistics started out as basically within applied linguistics. And if you think of things of applied linguistics, words and phrases and grammar and so on, and we've kind of gone, there's applied linguistics still there, but this is becoming more dominant now, this data science, it's language data, and we're analyzing it scientifically with statistical methods, visualization approaches, and where are we using it? We're applying it in a broader field of digital humanities and social science and law and healthcare and a whole broad scope. So I actually coined a term, which I normally don't like doing, but I think this is where we're, right, we're at now. It's not really corpus linguistics so much as just language data science. The corpus is gone, remember? The corpus is no longer a nicely constructed element or object, it's just data. <laughs> And we're going to analyze it scientifically, which then introduces the, what is science and how do we do science. So we're going from applied linguistics to language data science. So we're all like this now. It's kind of my background as well, I must say. So we start here in science. You start out by choosing a topic to investigate. Then you review the literature. You identify a gap or a problem in the, in the world that we know today, and then we design an experiment to solve this problem, and we collect the results and analyze the data, and we come up with our findings, which is science. That's what science is all about. So how is language data science different from chemistry or biology or physics? Well, I would say, well, first we're looking at words, and maybe that part's the interesting bit. This collecting and the analyzing data is quite different from physics and chemistry. The objects are words and we need this software to do that. Okay, so we, we finally come then to these three roots. So if you listen to that first discussion, you may be thinking now, wow, that's really interesting, I'll go for that. Or you may be thinking, whoa, this is beyond me. I don't wanna do this. So I think we actually have these three roots. So we're all researchers doing language research, but where do we wanna go from now? And I think we could go back to yesterday's plenary talk and think about this way. Yesterday, our keynote speaker was talking about a single karate dojo in, in the London district and looking at the language of a person, basically, or two people. So really manual analysis, close reading, ethnographic, and that's totally valid. It's very important and useful. So you could go that way, and I think that's great. You could go this way, where you're looking at more people, <laughs> looking at more interactions using traditional tool-based approaches, like with using Anconc or Wordsmith, like I just showed you. Or you could go this way. <laughs> Do you understand the reference here? This is mixed martial arts. It's like, get everything together. Karate and Judo and like K1 and let's everybody fight it out. And here you've got programming coming in, statistics coming in. You're gonna have programming languages. It's messy, it's, uh, it's cutting edge, it's, it's ahead of the time. And where are you? And they're all valid, if you think about it. This is great, this is great, and this is also good. So I think that's what you need to think about. Uh, where would you like to go? I would say the field is definitely going that way. But I don't want it to only go that way, and I definitely hope it's, this stays as a very important part. And people are already starting to say that. We don't want to forget close reading and detailed analysis not just throw everything into code and just trying to work it out. Okay, so let's stay in that middle road. I think the middle road is where I am right now, and I'm going uh, with the bottom as well, I must say. So what kind of tools do we have for traditional corpus-based research, which actually take us kind of from here down this direction a little bit? It actually helps. These tools are getting more advanced, but they're still simple and easy to use, but they take us that way to some extent. So some kind of cool things that you can do with current corpus tools. Okay, so I make a lot of tools, and this is my self-promotion part of the talk now. 
Uh, if you go to my website, so lawrenceanthony.net, you'll see about 20 tools. I, I literally have lost count. Okay. But what you'll see is there's kind of categories of these tools. Tools for first collecting data. Then there's tools for cleaning the data. You, I mentioned deleting the names and things. You don't have to do that one by one. There are tools like Sarant, which is search and replace. It's an automatic search and replace tool to clean things automatically. Encodant fixes uh, the encoding problems. Segmentant is a tool that will split Asian languages, Chinese, Japanese particularly, into actually kind of word forms. So it segments text into words so that we can then count them. Okay. And then we have tagging and annotating. I just talked about tagant as used for post part of speech tagging, but we also have things like clauseant, which is a more advanced tagging tool. Segmentant not only splits text, but it also part of speech tags Japanese and Chinese. So you could do that. And mover does discourse level automatic tagging as well. OK, so those are those. And then we have the analysis tools, and there's a whole lot of them. Uh, play with them. There's so many tools around, not just mine. There are many other people's. So it's not what tools are there. It comes back to choose the topic, review the literature, identify a gap. What do you want to do? Start there, and then pick a tool that will do this. So I'm going to give you an example, a case study of how you might approach doing some kind of cool, I think, language data science, I use that term now, language data science, in the area of social media, which is traditionally impossible to do with tools. You would have to code. Even, say, two or three years ago, you would have to code most of this directly with Python or R. OK, so we all know that Twitter and Facebook and Instagram are super popular, and people communicate with the, on those platforms a lot, maybe more than writing, more than speaking, maybe. <laughs> okay, So analyzing this data is super interesting. And what's nice about social media data is that it, when, it, when people send their tweets or their Instagram messages or Facebook posts, there's all kinds of um, annotated data that goes with the post. So we know, we know exactly who said it, when, where, who are their friends, and so on. This is an interesting visualization. It shows you how amazing this social media is. I'm going to switch to an, uh, the internet browser for a second. So we can, because people can track that data, we can visualize it live. Who is tweeting right now and where? You see different place, Japan, United States, Philippines, Brazil. We can see live people actually sending tweets and talking. But what we can also do, which is kind of scary, we can take that data live and analyze it. Who's saying what, where, when, why, and how to others? OK, it's kind of scary. So when you send a tweet, if you don't Twitter, Twitter is a very nice platform for doing analysis because it's very open and the data is very clean. As you can see here, very clean. <laughs> OK. Let me explain. So when you send a tweet, for example, or a Facebook page or an Instagram uh, picture, it sends this kind of data. That's one tweet. And inside this, you might see very up here, created at. And that's a field in the data saying the time that it was sent. We know the text that was actually sent, the tweet. But we also know things like the location of where it was sent. We know the name of the person who sent it. We know where they sent it to. We know how many friends they have, and so on. It's all in here. It's kind of scary. OK. <laughs> Analyzing this, though, is super difficult, because how do we process that? Word, Excel is not going to work with this. It's a special data format called JSON, a JSON file. So you need special tools to analyze that. And what I've released a couple of years ago now is a tool that will automatically analyze this and help you do social media data analysis. So this is called FireAnt, and it's a Twitter data collection first and analysis tool. OK, so let me just briefly, that's the, that's the main interface. But what you can also do is go to the file menu, and you basically go to the Twitter data collector. 
and then you specify the folder to save the data, and you say your search terms and who you want to track and whose data you want to borrow or collect, borrow, take, steal, no. <laughs> and then it will collect that data in a form that you can then analyze with traditional corpus tools, okay, like that. So here's the result, and you can take that and you can filter it and find different people and so on. Not only that, because you know when the data was sent, you can, within the tool, find out like the distribution of tweets over time. You can do things like find where they tweeted from. This is all in the tool, I should say. You can do network graphs to show who spoke to who, and then you can output those into a, a specialized data visualization tool that will produce some beautiful graph, like some of the ones I showed you earlier. Sounds kind of complicated, but it's actually surprisingly easy. So let me give you an example there. OK, so imagine we're interested. It's not quite bilingual education, but um, I'm very interested in cross-cultural uh, business. So how do General Motors in the US and Toyota interact with their customers? So we have in America. So we have this traditional American company, General Motors, and we've got this outside company, Toyota, coming in. And they're all communicating with the customers in America through Twitter and Facebook and so on. So you might think, OK, how successful are social media campaigns by these different companies? How can Asian automobile companies adapt to the Western ideals or models of social interaction? What language training should be given to the people who send these messages out? And so on. So what I did for this talk was collected all of the General Motors and Toyota tweets since Toyota started. G General Motors actually started tweeting earlier than T Toyota, but I started collecting all the data from the start of, of Toyota to uh, last year when I finished this analysis. And I collected 971 tweets from the General Motors account, and Toyota was 2,581, making a total of 3,552. OK, so what did I find when I did this real analysis, when I collected more of the data and did a proper analysis of this? Well, first, I found that there is a difference between who the companies talk to. OK, so when GM tweets, it talked to these people. So Jim is in the middle, and these are all the people that GM spoke to. And the little circles means a person, and the distance from there means far away. Closer means they tweeted a lot. The closer means more closer connection. And t Toyota, though, was a smaller number of people and kind of all the same distance. So some people seem to be talking a lot to GM, or GM was talking to a lot, to a person a lot. Why? Why were they tweeting one person more than, for example, here? Kind of interesting result from that. If we look at the time series, we see that, interestingly, Toyota tweeted a lot more than GM did. So maybe the, the Japanese strategy used social media, embraced social media more than the GM people. We can change the scale so we can kind of cumulatively show this result. It's the same graph, just summarizes it a little bit clearer. So clearly, Toyota's tweeting more than GM. There's a spike here in tweets between 2016 and 2017. But then I started looking at what are they saying when they're tweeting. And if we look at distribution of tweets with the word thank you and thanks and thank you very much, well, T Toyota was saying thank you a lot. Well, 25 times on that day, or in that month, I should say, in that month. Okay, GM didn't say thanks very much. What it was saying was sorry. There's a lot of sorry from GM. There's some sorry here as well, but you can see there's a spike of saying sorry to all these people. And if we look, so we can look at Toyota's thank you tweets and we say, yeah, we know the feeling. Thanks for sharing the love. Thanks for being such a great customer. Thank you for being part of the Toyota family. No specific name I mention, but most of the time they're just saying, thanks, great, we love you too. And if we look at GM, it's like, we're truly sorry to hear this. <laughs> we're sorry about this. We're sorry, apologies for the delay. This is one interaction. So it's what's happening is that they keep having to communicate with individuals to solve problems. And Toyota isn't, interestingly. Why not? I'm not sure. 
Okay, a different policy it looks like. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that you can do. So we can also do things like how does Toyota use English in local PR announcements now? So this is in Japan. What do they do in Japan when they tweet to people? Here's a typical Japanese tweet. You may not be able to read most of this, but you will be able to see the English. Okay. Uh, everybody loves the Back to the Future's DeLorean car. Okay. And it's, they're, they're promoting this event with this car. Okay. So the question now is like when, where, why, and how does Toyota use English in its local domain? Is Toyota's use of English effective? Do we see good reaction from people when they tweet? What is the reply? And we can see that. We can see people replying or reacting. Are Toyota PR slogans more effective in English than Japanese? And so on. Okay. So I, did a, I collected this as well. I won't show the demonstration, but we just type that name in. We collect all the PR tweets. We uh, look at the data, and then we can do things like the tweet frequency. So there's a massive spike in July this year. I don't know why, but we can find out. And some spikes here. And if we look at the frequency of words, because we can do a standard corpus analysis, because we've got the data now, we can see that the, the most frequent English word was C. It's a car name. It's part of a car name. Toyota was there. Uh, volume, concept, kirobo. These are many words related to car names. It's kind of boring. Car names are English in Japanese in uh, society. But there is this word in, and I thought that was quite unusual, so high up in frequency. So when we looked at in, there's these phrases in the Japanese tweet. Toyota drive in Japan, in mega web, made in Thailand, arts in hearts. So they're using slogans, English slogans, within the Japanese tweet, and I really don't know why yet. Are they effective? It's something to investigate. The important point to remember, though, is that this is just an example of taking a ready-made tool, reading the user guide, it's not that long, and then just basically clicking and collecting data and then processing it. And there are like 20 tools on my website that can do these kinds of things. OK, so we're coming to the end. OK, so uh, where do we go from here? It, OK, if you want to learn and apply corpus tools, where, what, what should your direction be from now? So I think there's three things to do. Understand the nature of language data science, then choose the right path, and then follow and formulate best practices. Let me just go through this. So first, understand science. We're scientists now, and scientists start out with a what, why, and how. So what are you wanting to investigate first? Don't start with tools. Don't start with a corpus tool and think, what can I do with this? Go the other way and think, what do I want to know about language? Then review the literature. Find out what about this, what do people already know about this topic? And then identify a gap or a problem that you want to investigate. So that's the topic, but it's not the research. The topic might be Toyota PR. The gap might be, are there PR campaigns effective or not? So it's slightly different. Then we design an experiment. What data are you going to use? What tools are you going to use? Are you going to program? Are you going to use AntConc? Are you going to use FireAnt? How big is the data? And then collect it, analyze it, and discuss the results. So get that first. Definitely start here, not here. Okay. The next thing is choose the right route. Maybe you're not that kind of person who wants to do programming and so on, and that's fine. So I think here, what are your strengths and weaknesses, and who can you work with? Because if you can work with others, like me, I'm not interested in this, to be honest. I don't do close reading and detailed ethnographic studies. I'm not interested. But I love working with people who are, because then I can help them with tools and analysis and they can do some close reading, and we get a really good study together. So find people who you can work with, and then you'll get some good results. And the last thing is what data, tools, and methods are commonly used. First, you need to know the field. 
So there are lots of very good books covering the field of corpus linguistics. Very famous one is Doug Biber's Corpus Linguistics from the 80s, I think 90s. Then we have more recent ones, Susan Hunston, a great scholar from the University of Birmingham. Tony McHenry and Andrew Hardy's book on corpus linguistics from Lancaster. We've got the Rutledge Handbook. We've got contemporary corpus linguistics. Again, Paul Baker was involved. So read, basically, it's kind of obvious. But then there are a growing number of books which are kind of more technical. Statistics in corpus linguistics and programming corpus linguistics, nice handbooks, practical corpus linguistics using tools and so on. My, my Vice made that, wrote, wrote that. So don't just stay there. Uh, find how can you best utilize and improve on these best practices. And that's your contribution to the field. Maybe it's close reading or maybe it's programming, but that would be your route. Thank you.